Testing, testing one, two, three, testing one, two, three. Test, 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 test. All right, my name is uh, E.J. Daigle, Dean of Manufacturing here at Dunwoody College. And today we're gonna to talk a little bit about the, uh, the Maple Systems HMI. Um, and really it's, it's less about just the Maple Systems HMI uh, specifically as a brand, um, but also more about HMIs in general and how they they work um, with our industrial control system. All right, so the first thing I want to talk about is, you know, what is a human machine interface? That's what HMI actually stands for, is human machine interface. And what I tell you is a human machine interface is, is where people and technology meet. Um, so the most common thing we're going to see is something like what you see over here where you see um, in this case, looks like it's a packaging line or some sort of automated manufacturing line. And we'll see a touchscreen HMI up here. And touchscreen HMI has been around for many years now. Um, but what they've, what they've tended to do is they've tended to replace hardwired buttons and hardwired indicators um, with the advent of things like industrial networks. We can send a lot of data over a network cable back and forth um, without having to wire up every single thing as an individual push button. So that's one of the most common things um, that we'll see in, in our industry here, but they're everywhere, you know? So even though this isn't a, uh, an industrial use per se, um, you get to the airport now and we have these self check-in stations. And so when you step stand in line for, you know, half an hour trying to check in your luggage or trying to, uh, you know, uh, pay for your bag or check in and print your boarding pass, now all that can be done uh, right at the airport through these these kiosk systems, um, which makes the airport much more efficient as well. And then finally, you know, the, the automated teller machine. I don't know if these have been around probably for 40 years or more. Um, the automated teller machine actually has replaced the need um, to go to the bank. You know, banks are open, let's say, 9 to 5, Monday through Friday. Um, used to be that if you wanted to get money, uh, you had to go into the bank. I can remember as a kid, you'd go into the bank and you'd deposit money or you'd go to the bank and you withdraw money. Um, a lot of times you'd actually keep a little book where you kept tabs of your balance on the bank account. Now this ATM, I can get money anytime I want. I can uh, go to an ATM at, you know, uh, two o'clock in the morning and withdraw $300. I can, uh, I can even deposit money. Well, not, and nowadays it's even more so in that I can, you know, take a picture of a check and, uh, and go onto a website or an, onto an app and, and deposit as well. When we talk about HMI, so it's not always a big fancy screen. You know, the HMI can be as simple as the, the interface or the, the grip of a hand tool uh, to something as complex as the flight deck of a jumbo jet. So all of these things are how the human interfaces to the machine. All right, now where we're gonna use them both in this class and we're gonna see them out in industry primarily is right here. So we're going to use a, a Maple Systems HMI um, in, in lab. One of the reasons why we use the Maple Systems HMI is that we use a lot of different PLCs. So we use Siemens, um, we use uh, the RS500 or Allen Bradley's RS500 platform, we use the RS5000 platform, um, we even at, even at times uh, go in there and use an Omron PLC. Well the nice thing about the Maple Systems HMI the Maple Systems HMI is a generic HMI. It's, it's actually been produced to communicate with all of the different PLC manufacturers. That's one of the big benefits of it um, as far as being kind of a generic PLC or generic HMI. It means the setup is, can be a little tricky at times. The addressing can be a little tricky at times. Um, but for that, you get the universality of, of being able to use it with a lot of different vendors. Um, the addressing, let's say, of a Allen Bradley HMI to an Allen Bradley PLC may be easier, um, but if you wanted to make that Allen Bradley HMI talk to someone else's PLC, um, might be a little more difficult. So what does the HMI do? Well, we can see here the HMI is talking to the PLC. We're sending information, we're getting information back. Um, the PLC then might be talking to a motor drive, so maybe over on the HMI I might type in, hey, I need the, the motor to go at 500 RPMs. Or I need it to go forward or reverse. Well, that's going to get processed by the PLC, sent to the drive, and the drive's going to make that decision as to what frequency I need on that motor. Um, or in the case of a servo, a servo drive, similar deal. Um, we have all of our physical inputs, all of our physical I/O. So where these are kind of like soft I/O on the on the on the uh, the HMI, I'd call soft I/O. I'd call these down here. I'd call this hard I/O. 
um, or hardwired I.O. Hardwired push button switches and sensors, hardwired outputs like solenoids and fans and buzzers and indicators and so on. So that gives you an idea of, how, of where we're going with this class. Up to this point, we've really only messed around with the uh, with the PLC. Is the only thing you've really had a chance to play with. Well, now we're going to interface that to the HMI. Oh, and guess what? Later on, we're going to interface that to a drive and a motor. Then we're going to, you know, so on and so forth. And I guess we have at this point done PLC with I.O. We just now we're going to interface the HMI with that. So the one that we're using is the HMI 5043LB. This is a Maple Systems product. Um, very small screen, 4.3 inch touch display, 16 bit color. So we have 65,536 colors available. It has one Ethernet port that we can use for programming. Um, we also can use that Ethernet port for communications as well. The first PLC we're going to be working with is RS500, the Slick 500. So because we're using the RS500 platform and um, not all the Slicks are running Ethernet, we're going to be using a RS232 communication port to the PLC. So we'll be doing our setup via Ethernet, and then we'll be doing our COM between the PLC and the HMI over RS232. It also has a USB port. Uh, for programming or or other USB devices, uh, we can run it in portrait or landscape mode. That means that you can run it, you know, horizontal like this, or you could even install it vertical like this. Um, depending on your your situation, you may want to install it one way or the other. And it supports all PLC manufacturers. I tried to say from A to Z, uh, there isn't a PLC manufacturer or a drive manufacturer that is Z, but there is one with Y. So everything from Allen Bradley to Yaskawa. You'll see all of those in the and everything in between as far as who it supports. So the HMI can take place of several hardware devices. You know, from the, the input side, we have physical inputs such as push button switches, potentiometers. So you'll see like here you have a, a, a switch that can go stop, reverse, forward. So it's a soft switch. You know, you might have a, these could be indicators or buttons. They look like they're indicators in this case. I have, I have power. I have a run, jog, alarm, jam, so on and so forth. It looks like those are indicators. I've got time remaining, so I can have uh, integers and floats and all kinds of different values. So physical inputs, and then the, then the physical outputs, the pilot lights, numeric displays, LCDs, and so on. So HMI applications, one of the ones we'll do right off the bat is we'll start and stop a motor. So instead of creating a, and we can do this a couple of different ways, right? Um, we can start and stop it from a hardware push button station, but we can also start and stop it from a soft push button station using HMI. Uh, we'll set and monitor times and counts. So now if you want that preset value on how long that fan is gonna run for. So I start the fan, it runs for five minutes. Um, now I could change that. I could in an HMI type in, well, I want it to run for 10 minutes. So it's gonna run for 10 minutes. I could display numeric data uh, such as counts. You see this on like parking ramps in, in downtown. I walk, drive up to a parking ramp and it says there's 34 spaces left. Well, that really is an HMI for us. So we know if the lot's full and we can drive in or if it's not full. Graphics and animations. So you could actually, as something is moving or turning on or running, I could have an animation or an indication that shows what's going on on the screen as well. Alarm conditions, that's one of our big ones here. We can have alarm conditions both from an indicator, but we can also have alarm conditions uh, such as readouts, like temperature too high or, uh, you know, pump shut down due to some sort of failure or something like that. And we can also control user access. So there, there may be different levels of user access that I want. You know, our operators may have just an operator screen. And in an operator screen, all they can do is start and stop the system. Uh, maybe they can run it a couple different ways. Maybe they can set the speed. But our maintenance folks might be able to go into that and pull up the alarm and pull up some data logging, or they might might be able to change some of the uh, the variables that we don't want the operators to mess with. And we can even password protect these different screens if we want some people to have a certain level of access and others to not have as much access. All right. Um, in addition to that, we can create multiple screens. So EasyWare Plus software allows for 2,000 screens. So even you got, even though you have this small screen, what you can do is you could have on the main screen, you could say, well, you know, I've got machine one, I've got machine two, I've got machine three, or conveyor lines, conveyor lines one, two, three, and four. And if I plus on one, it'll take me to screen one. And screen one might have a start, 
a stop, maybe have some indicators. Um, in screen two, we'll have something else. So it's similar to a web page where I have a home screen where everybody starts when I first boot up. But from that home screen, I can go here, I could go here, I could go here, and maybe from this screen, I got some, some other uh, child screens that I can go to. What you want to be careful if you're going to do this with uh, going multiple screens, it gives you the ability to have a lot of different buttons, a lot of different features. Um, I always tell people to be very, very careful. Always include a home or main screen link. So like this little home button, I might put that little home button in the same location on every single one of these screens. So no matter where I'm at, I can always get back to my main screen. You know, I don't want to I don't want to get to screen six, only discover I'm stuck on screen six, and the only way to get back to screen one is by cycling power to the HMI. That's not what we want to do. So just keep that in mind if you start linking screens to screens, that we always want to have a way to get back. Um, normal PCIP settings. So I bring this up because we are going to start messing around with our PCIP settings today. Um, so in doing so, I just want to show you kind of what we normally use on our PC which is if you go into your control panel and then you go to the network and sharing and then you go to local area connection, you can kind of see me going through the screens here, right? Control panel, then I went to network and sharing, then I went to local area connection, then I went to properties, and now I go to TCP IP version four, and then I go to properties. And I'm gonna get to the screen where for normal use at the college here, we are gonna obtain an IP address automatically. Um, the reason being is we're connecting to Dunwoody's network and we are uh, surfing the internet. We might be printing things. We might be uh, storing things on a network drive. So we're always gonna obtain that IP address uh, automatically. However, when we go to use the HMI, we actually need to set an IP address. So we're gonna turn off obtain IP address automatically and we're gonna to go to use the following IP address. And you might say, well, where do, we, where do these numbers come from um, when I go to do this? And, and by the way, the reason why I include this previous slide is because at some point, after you've set up your HMI to talk via ethernet, you're gonna to need to go back to this. Um, or when you go to log in and print something, it's not gonna print because you don't have your IP address set up correctly. So I do include this slide in here you may want to print it out and just have it so you know how to get back here if you need to. But in this case, we're going to set our addresses as such. The mask is really what allows these addresses to come through. Um, but the most important part for us is this IP address. I'm going to give my PC this IP address. And you might say, well, why are you giving your PC that IP address? Well, because I know when I go to look at my HMI, my HMI has an address like this. So with the, the 11 workstations in the lab, um, you're going to see those addresses are going to start 192.168.1. You know, and I can see in this particular case, this one is 211. All you have to do is look at the sticker on your HMI, and you can see what the address is for your particular HMI. Um, so what we've done is we've put you, what I'd say is kind of in the, in the same zip code as the HMI that you're working on. So 192.168.1.10, you're giving your computer that address so it can talk to a 192.168.1.211. So we're in the same, the same subset of, of octets here. Um, the only thing that's really changing is those last three digits. So that's gonna be an important thing. So now you've got three different things. We went from our original normal PCIP settings we change those IP settings to support the HMI. So this is what's on the PC now. Then we go into the EasyWare software. And the EasyWare software is where we can set up that IP address. Again, the IP address is already labeled on your HMI. It is possible for you to change it, but I'd ask you to keep it the same if you can. Um, but this is the address for the, the Maple Systems HMI in the EasyWare software now. And what I'll tell you, when it comes to talking between the PLC and the HMI, um, there's something else we got to do. So because we're going to use, we're going to use an RS-232 connection to talk between the HMI and the, and the, and the, uh, the PLC, we need to go do further settings. So in EasyWare Plus, we're going to set up comm settings. And in RS-Links, we're going to set up comm settings. 
And this COM port here is whatever your normal COM port is. So if you've got, if you're normally on COM4, then you're going to be on COM4. But what's interesting that I want you to note here is this is COM3 on the RS links, and this happens to be COM1 in EasyWare. But what's important is that we want this 19.2 um, to be the same on both sides here. You see how this works. It would be bad if we set up the uh, the HMI to talk at, you know, I don't know, 9600 um, baud, and then you set this to speak at uh, 19.2, these two aren't going to be able to talk to each other because they're, they're essentially they're speaking at a different rate. They're not going to be able to understand each other. So it's important that these settings match. The only, the only setting that really doesn't need to match would be the COM port setting. So you can see my stop bit is one, my stop bit is one. Uh, what else is in here? Uh, parity, I got none. Parity, I got none. Um, error checking, I guess we don't have that over here. But you can see what we've done is we've really selected. Actually, we do have the error checking here. You see the BCC? And you see the BCC, so it's a little bit different setting when we go the serial BCC is actually the PLC type on EasyWare. But the goal is to make these two be the same. Again, the thing that's going to be different is the COM ports are going to be different. So if that's COM3 and this is COM1, that's okay. But everything else should be the same so these two can talk to each other. Otherwise, you've got your HMI speaking French and your, your, uh, your PLC speaking English. It's not going to work out so well. I want to show you a couple of other things here real quick. So the Maple Systems website is a great tool. You can go on here and, and learn a lot. Um, the two PLCs that we're primarily, primarily going to use this HMI with are the Slick 500 and the Compact Logics. I bring this up because when I show you this, what you're going to see is a nice data sheet. Um, so you can go right back to this uh, that, that screen that I just showed you there. This nice data sheet tells me, hey, your Maple Systems HMI can talk to the slick 501, 502, 503, 504, 505. Oh, and also any of the MicroLogix PLCs as well. So I mean, pretty much any of your RS500 platform. But it's also going to give you kind of your, your PLC registers. Um, so <clears throat> in this case, if I have a, a T4 um, preset value or an accumulated value, and be careful here, you know, it'll give you some funky, funky things here. PV may not mean the same thing as what you think it does. Uh, preset value and accumulated values. So it kind of gives you the, the format of those um, and how you format those if you're using the uh, the HMI as well. And I think probably the, the best one to look at when you look at these is when you go down here. So for example, if I have a integer data file 97 address 45 in the PLC, I would address this as N97 colon 45 so that's something we're, we're familiar with right as far as how this would uh this would get get addressed um in the uh in the hmi though i would select the device type n you know this is really uh going to tell me that it's an integer file and then my address would be 097045 so it's important when you're doing this, um, the right number of zeros, the right number. So because this can be addressed from all the way up to 255, I don't write 9745. I write 097045. So this is one of the things I was telling you about a few minutes ago where it, it seems a little bit strange the first time you do it. But once you've done it a few times, it's actually not that bad. You know, so your, your binary bits here, you know, how I'm gonna, there's six things that got to go in there. So... It's actually not that bad. And once you play with it a little bit, I think you'll find there's lots of examples as you read through these files. So that this this document's really good. And then the compact logic's very similar. If I go to the compact logics file, it's gonna have very similar stuff and, and tell you how to worry about it. I will tell you compacts are a little bit funky um, because we we map. Um, we have to map the the IO a little bit. So you'll map PLC SLC. So because our file numbers and our, our really tag names in the compact logic, there's there's a little bit of an extra step that we'll have to we'll have to take. But again, this this document goes through it extremely well and walks you right through whatever you might need. All right. So with that, I think the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you just a couple of quick demos and show you how this how this software works. I'm gonna discard my uh, my uh, 
annotations there. And we'll go into the, uh, there we go, BitLogic. So if you go into Maple Systems, and on my computer, it's going to be, uh, I've got a Maple Systems folder in here. You guys should too. And mind you, we've got a couple of them on here right now. Easy Builder is the one that we use for a different version, the older version. Um, all of our HMI work now, will now be done in EasyWare Plus. So go ahead and click on EasyWare Plus. Uh, when you launch EasyWare Plus, it's going to say, what do you want to do? A new project, open existing, or open a recent? I'm just going to do a new project. And then it's going to ask me, well, what HMI do you have? You know, you could have any one of these. So you can just look on the back of the HMI. I will tell you that we have the 5043 LB, which is 480 by 272. And you could pick, do you want it in landscape or portrait? I'm gonna, they're all installed in landscape, so to put it portrait, you don't want to be reading these things on their side. Hit OK. Um, it may give you an error about listed fonts are not currently installed on the PC. So if it, so there's a font that Maple uses that isn't currently on my, my PC. I can actually select a replacement font, font. So this Arial Narrow Bold, Maple uses it, but for whatever reason, my PC doesn't. So I'm gonna give it the replacement font so I don't have to get any errors with that. Now this is where you would actually set up your, your PLC. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to, um, I'm gonna end up using local because I don't have a PLC hooked up to mine right now, but I do wanna show you where this is at. So if you go to new, it's gonna give you this, you'll see this mod bus up here. Under PLC type, these are all the different PLCs you can use. And again, I said from A to, A to, A to Y, right? So from ABB all the way down to uh, you know Siemens and all the way down to Yaskawa. Actually, there's a Yokoka, Yokogawa. I don't even know what that one is. But for us, it doesn't matter. We're going to go to Alan Bradley. And uh, let's see here. We, we did Serial. We did Slick. Serial BCC. And so I only remember that because we were just looking at those settings a few minutes ago. So again, if I did Serial Slick with CRC, then I would need to make sure my RS Link set settings were set for CRC. Um, and I don't remember these exactly. I think CRC is cyclic redundancy check and BCC. It doesn't matter. Um, for, for our purposes, that's the way they, they do uh, like bit checking and stuff. Um, but for our purposes, we just need to make sure they're the same. RS Links and Maple Systems are the same. So I pick BCC. And then once I'm in there, uh, so local settings, this is where I could go into my settings now and I could select the COM port, COM1, 19.2, and that's something I had showed you before. For the most part, this is gonna be correct. As long as you don't have a PLC set up to a different baud rate, this should all be good, but do a check. I'd open up RS Links right now. I'd check its, its settings and do an auto config, make sure those COM settings are the same um, because we are gonna make this thing talk RS-232. Once I hit okay, you'll see that um, I have the local PLC and I could give that PLC a name. You know, if I want to give it a different name, um, I could give it a different name. For my purpose though, um, when you're programming in the lab, you'll need to use this slick now. That's what you'll use and you'll hit okay. For my purposes, we're gonna only use local bits right now because I don't have a PLC hooked up. So I'm gonna show you how to simulate it offline is what I'll do. So I'll go ahead and click on local HMI and hit okay. All right. And now that I've got that set up, I'm gonna get this little window going. I don't need that guy open right now. There we go. Make it a little smaller. Uh, you can make your view a little bit bigger if you like to. Uh, oh, let's see here, zoom level. Make it a little bigger if we want. All right, so let's do the most basic thing. Um, let's say that we wanted to turn a bit on and we wanted that bit to that, <coughs> that bit then to energize something on the PLC. <coughs> One of my simplest ones here is the, the function called set bit. I'm gonna grab set bit. Um, and again, we're on local HMI. If I was on the Allen Bradley, um, I'd actually get the Allen Bradley addresses. So if I went to Allen Bradley, you'd actually see B3 files and I's and O's and all kinds of stuff. Um, when I do local HMI, which you guys won't use, all I'm really gonna get an access for is this local, this local bit or this local byte. Um, and I wanna set this bit on. And then I wanna give it a shape. So I want the button to look like something. So I'll go into the, the shape library. 
and I can see that this library looks pretty wimpy. So I can also add a library here. If I click on add a library, again right here, add a library. I can go down to button one, this is a library I can add. Now I'm getting some stuff that looks pretty good. So I see this green button, maybe that would be my turn the bit on. Hit okay, hit okay. Um, I might wanna label it and click on use label. Maybe I'll say uh, uh, motor on. And you can change the you can change the font color, you can change the font size, you can do all kinds of stuff. But when you hit OK, and it, again, it's gonna set the bit LB0 to on. So I'm gonna hit OK. Brings it up as a ghost image. And I can go ahead and place that somewhere on the screen. And let's say I wanna create another one of those, but we want one for motor off. So I'll go to set bit again. Local bit, but this time instead of set on, I'll set it off. Mind you, there's toggles, there's momentaries, there's all kinds of stuff in here. I'm going to go shape, and instead of this shape, instead of a green one, I'm going to pick a red one. Give it a little different color. And instead of labeling it motor on, I'm going to label it motor off. And hit OK. Now I got these two buttons. They look pretty good. Uh, you might, and I will tell you, people get finicky about the real estate on the HMI. Don't get too crazy about that. Um, get them close. You know something like this I'm like okay those look good you can actually draw a big loop around both of them and there's some alignment tools in here let me see if I can find them again here oh uh, where are they hiding on me here moving shape no it's not what I'm looking for okay where are they at I think I got a toolbar turned off here view standard duh, 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 duh. There we go. The edit toolbar is where it was. It was on the edit toolbar. And on here, if I have the, if I have both of these buttons highlighted by just drawing a circle around them, I can actually do a uh, align horizontal centers. And now they look really nice. They're, you know, they're as good as can be. And if I want to move them both, I can move them both then, but they stay aligned. Um, now I want to add a lamp. I want a bit lamp that's going to tell me when this thing is on and when it's not on. So I'll go ahead and go into a bit lamp. And under shapes... Uh, let's see here shape library I'm gonna add that library again for the buttons because for the for the lamps I don't have that added in right now now that it's in if I scroll down I think there's some nice yeah there's some nice lamps down here. here's a nice green lamp hit okay and hit okay you know and I could I could put motor on it but I'm gonna actually gonna put it here and then instead of putting motor inside of it I'm gonna use the text tool this guy right here to type the word motor in like white so it'll stand out on the screen motor status and hit ok and what you'll see is that I've got this nice little indicator here that's going to tell me the motor status now mind you if you were using this on the PLC I would most likely have this tag to like a b30 file so I've got a binary bit inside my ladder logic that I can turn on and off. Um, and this would be, you know, I'd set the B30 file on, I'd set the B30 file off. And then this would also be tagged, um, you know, it could be in parallel, but it could be the B30 file could be in parallel with, uh, let me give you an example of what I'm talking about here. I lost my pen. Uh, I don't know where my pen is hiding here. I guess I lost it. Oh, there it is. Um, but to give you an example of what I mean, Let's say I had this set up kind of like we have here in my, this is my HMI code over here. This is what I'm doing on the HMI code. And if I'm setting B3 uh, colon zero slash zero, if I'm setting that bit on and off, you know, this sets it on and this sets it off. If those two buttons just set that bit on and off, and if this just gives me the, the status of B3 zero slash zero, then in my in my ladder on the PLC side, I would it'd be very very simple actually. I might have my ladder here that goes to uh, B three colon zero slash zero. That would then go to um, uh, let's see here. Maybe it would go to uh, oh I don't know. Maybe it'd go to an actual output O colon two slash one. And maybe this would be my motor starter. 
you know, so you can see how simple this would be to put, put in place. And actually, then this wouldn't even have to be B3 0 slash 0 anymore. Now it could actually be O colon 2 slash 1. I could actually read the output. So if this start sets this bit on, the motor kicks on, and if the stop resets the bit off, then the motor turns off. And this just gives me a status of the motor. In the real world, this is the only thing that actually is connected to a screw terminal. Everything else is is a is a virtual. It's a virtual device, a virtual coil or a virtual contact or whatever you whatever you're working with. All right, so go back into the into the uh, into the status here. So now I've got this. Um, it requires you to do three things. I want to do what's called an offline simulation. It's not going to let me do it right now because it requires you to save it, compile it, and then do the offline simulation. But if you click offline simulation, it'll tell you, well, you need to save it first. So I'm going to go test two, and then you need to compile it. So it compiled it, and now it's downloaded it. It actually hasn't downloaded it. It simulated downloading. It really just compiled it but it brought you up what the screen is gonna look like. So I can test drive this thing. If I click on motor on, the motor turns on. Click on motor off, the motor turns off. And I'm getting a status of that local bit. Again, I'm not doing it in real life. Real life, these would have to be tagged to different things that are actually gonna be in my ladder logic. So it requires programming in two areas. I got a program in the HMI and I got a program in the PLC. Now there are some newer versions of software out there I know the Siemens S7-1200, a couple of the other PLC manufacturers are allowing you to do it all in one package, um, which makes it much, much simpler. And you can actually do that with uh, uh, the RS-5000 platform now as well. Um, and then if I want to close this out and be done, I'm done. And I might say, wow, that's pretty cool. You know, I like that. Um, well, let's say, let's say I, w I wanted, I didn't want to do that. Let's say I wanted to do something else. Um, you know, I could... Let's go over to here. Oh, what do we got to do here? Settings. No, let's not do that. File. I don't know that I was ready to do that yet either. Uh oh. Well, I got it saved, so that's the good news. I go right back to where I was. There's my test two. Da -da -da. Loading hide. All right, I like it. Uh, settings all right all right so let's take a look at something else we could do here so we've got the motor that we're controlling over here and we got the motor status you can see we're going to run out of real estate if we do too much here but i'll do one other thing here i want to give you a numeric status at least so you've got two other things here you've got a, a numeric and you've got an ASCII. And the difference between these numeric and ASCII, numeric is numeric. I can read numeric data, I can write numeric data. And ASCII would be things like text. So if I want to actually maybe have a password or, or I want somebody to type in a message or something um, on the HMI, they could do that. We'll do a numeric. So I'm gonna go to numeric and you can see that we can do a numeric format. Now this is another place where you need to be really, really picky about this. Um, this 16-bit unsigned um, is going to work fine for what I'm doing with my local bit. Um, but what we know is when we're working with, like, let's say, a, a, a timer or a counter in RS-500, we know that that's actually a 16-bit signed, isn't it? Um, so another place you can go wrong here is if you're trying to use, let's say, 32-bit unsigned um, on the HMI and you're trying to write to a 16-bit signed location, be very, very careful. That's going to cause you trouble. So I'm going to call this a uh, uh, new numeric object, 16-bit uh, signed. I can do decimal places. I'm just going to have four. I'll do three digits. And I can have some values here for low, high values that I can put in there. You'll notice if I put an extra digit in there, I get an extra 9999. If I take one out, I get that. If I put a decimal place in there, uh, you'll notice it, uh, it kind of shows you what, what's going to happen down here if I do that. So I'm gonna left of the decimal place. I'm gonna be able to go from zero to nine nine nine. Uh, the shape it's gonna come in as just kind of a, a gray, gray uh, number type deal. So I'm gonna go ahead and place this here, and above it I'm gonna put in some text just so we know what we're looking for, and I'll make this white. 
and I'm going to call this numeric entry. And put that right above it. And then rather than looking at it on something trivial like another display, I'm wondering if we couldn't uh, you know, pick something a little more interesting to look at. We got function keys. Uh, what do we got here? We got bar graphs. Let's grab a little bar graph. Let's throw that bar graph in here. And bar graph gets its own little shape. Um, and it's going to say, what's the min? What's the max? Well, I believe my min and max are going to be 0 to 999. But you can also give a low limit. So like a low limit, maybe I'll call it less than 50. And maybe a high limit, I'll put it 950. The neat thing about that is if it gets too low, it turns yellow. If it gets too high, it turns red. Otherwise, in between, it'll be blue. So numeric entry. And then this will be my uh, this will be my what I'll call my bar graph. And you can also like in here you can also grab and just make a copy of your oh, control C, control V. There we go. Sorry about that. I got my numeric entry, and then I've got my bar graph. And those are both in there now. And again, if I wanted to line these up, I could just highlight them all and align them horizontally there that's good now we get something a little more interesting so I can hit save I can hit compile right here when I compile it should give me no errors I hope compiling fonts zero errors zero warnings so I'll hit close and normally this is where I would go to download um, which is right here download but again I'm not hooked up you can also do an online simulation so once you've downloaded you can actually control the data online from your computer screen but in this case, we're going to do an offline simulation. So we're going to pretend that we're hooked up or not. Now I got a couple interesting things here. Again, I can turn the motor on, I can turn the motor off. But if I go here and click and type in 800, let's say, look where my bar graph's at. If I type in 500, see where my bar graph's up. But if I type in 960, remember what that did is it turns red. And I think below 50, I also turned red also, right? Or turned yellow below 50 so you can see just by and what this would be on, on your physical screen in the real world is I would press with my finger on this and I would type in a, a number just like I'm doing right here 635 boom and I'm getting display now mind you if it's an integer this could go right into the the integer files in your in your PLC um, this could be the preset for a counter um, this could be the preset for a timer. It could be whatever you want it to be. So just kind of keep that in mind. And I can always close out by just doing that. I'm going to hit save. And the next thing I'm going to do is bring up the function key. I'm going to show you the function key. And let's see here. So we got a bunch of screens here. Um, but what I can do is I can change the full screen window. Um, I can I can go to a different window based upon what's happening here. Um, so just another another feature that you can do uh, if I want to throw a shape on it, like uh, you know, I think this is just going to show up as like maybe a gray. Sometimes I like to for whatever reason I sometimes like to do these as blue, just because I use, I end up using a lot of the the green and the the red for other things. So I might have a screen that I call, let's go in here, let's call it the motor control screen. So maybe I go to the motor control. Hit OK. And then maybe I'll create another one that I call the numeric control. Oops, get out of there. So I'll call this numeric. I got a motor control, a numeric control. One of the things I told you guys earlier too is I always want to get a, a home screen as well, right? So let's paste another one in here. And let's call this guy our home. Home screen. Have that guy available as well. And a lot of times I'll put him up top. So now we need to create Let's see here, it's a little different than, uh, let's see, can we do a new window here? Uh, 
windows window preview object list there we go so the window preview is kind of a, a messy deal I don't care about that I want the object list so I can go create new window and I'll call window 11 I'll call that my uh, I'm gonna call it uh, motor control hit enter and I'll go here right click new I'll call this numeric Boom. And now what I would do is I would take, let's say, all of these motor control pieces of the puzzle that I have. I'm going to grab all of them. Control C. I'm going to go to the motor control screen. I'm going to paste them in here. So the motor control screen is its own screen now. And it looks like a million bucks. And if I go to the numeric control, I want the numeric control pieces, which are all these pieces here. Copy. I should just be cutting them instead of copying them. And I'll go here and I'll make these my numeric control pieces. And I'm going to put them on the left, actually. I'll do the same thing with the motor control pieces. So I'll put, push those over to the left as well. The reason being is I then want to take those last three pieces. And I'm going to line those guys up next. And you can also do spacing on these, too. Uh, you can do a, oh, let's see here. What is it? Uh, make same height. Ooh, I want to make same width. Can I make same width? Oh, I can make same size. Make same width. I guess I can't do that. I was hoping I could. I can always make them a little bit different on their own by just grabbing them by the resizing handles. And doing something like that. Then I can do this and make them uh, uh, aligned. I can also get the spacing to be the same. There we go. That actually looks pretty good right there. And I'm going to put those over on the right hand side. Um, home screen doesn't really matter on this one, but I'm going to keep it here for a second because what's really well before we do this, let's remember what the motor control. Well, here I'm going to I'm going to show you on the next screen. Actually, I'm going to copy all those. Control C. And on the motor control screen, I'm going to post them here. And on the numeric control screen, I'm going to post them here. The idea is I'm going to go into each one of these now. And I want the home screen to take me back to the to window 10. Now, and I should actually call window 10 something different, shouldn't I? Let's call window 10 settings. Let's call this the home screen. So I got the home screen. Now they now they actually line up with names. But I want to make sure that these uh, when I'm on like this screen here, the home screen should take me to the home screen, right? The motor control screen should take me to the motor control screen. And here's the part that's a little goofy. The numeric control screen, I don't get to go to the numeric control screen. You know why? Because I'm already on the numeric control screen. So that one I can just get rid of. Then when I'm on the motor control screen, I'll have to get rid of the motor control screen and move numeric up. And now the numeric control screen now will take me to the numeric control screen. And the home screen will take me to the home screen if I wanted to. And finally, again, I can reline these guys up and respace them as I need spacing where I want it. I can get them uh, lined up again looking good. And finally on the home screen, I don't get a home screen because I'm already on it. Um, but I do get a motor control and a numeric control. So I go to motor control. It should take me to, I want to select motor control from the list. And if I go to numeric control, well guess what? I want to select numeric control from the list. And I could even, uh, you know, I could even put a, a list on here. This is my home screen, right? I could make it really big or something if I wanted somebody to know what screen they're on. I could make that really big and put it up in the corner or something like that. I could do that on every screen. But I'm, I'm kind of done playing around with that. You can see really quickly it can become unwieldy and you start, you start getting... Uh, worried about what I would call the trivial details. I don't want to get worried about the trivial details, so I'm going to compile it, save it, compile it. No errors. 
and then we go to an offline simulation. Now look what you got. Now what you've got is you've got this screen that from the home screen, I can pick motor control. If I go there, I can turn the motor on, I can turn the motor off, on, off, get it working. And from there, if I wanna go back to home, I can. And I can go to numeric. If I wanna type in a value for the numeric, let's say 941, there's the bar graph for it. If I wanna type in 965 and see that thing turn red, there it is. If I type in 520, it should go back to blue. So from here then, oops, I lost my screen there. So from here, again, I have two screens I can go to, home screen, or I could have gone to the other screen, right? So I've got numeric, I can get to motor or home. Motor, I can get to home or numeric, but if I always go back to home, and I'm almost like a, a, I'm almost a fan of just, even if you just put a home button on every one, that seems to be just as good a way to do it as any. All right, so let's see what we've demoed here. We've demoed the bit logic. We've demoed some of the basic numeric input and display categories. Uh, we did a bar graph. And we, we showed what the function keys can do. So with those things, and, and if you remember nothing else, this is the part that you really got to remember right here. Um, we're going to make these things talk ours 232 for the first time. Uh, we're not going to be, we'll be, we'll be programming via Ethernet, but we'll be using RS-232 to talk between the HMI and the PLC. So it's very important that those COM settings, again, those COM settings got to match. So what's in RS links needs to match what's in, what's in EasyWare. Again, the big difference being, you know, the, the COM ports will be different, but everything else should be the same. So with that, that completes my uh, my short lecture here on, on uh, the basics of, of using HMI, uh, specifically for the Maple Systems uh, uh, 5043LB, is that what it is? Let me see if I got this right. Yeah, 5043LB, and then the EasyWare software as well. So with that, I'll leave it to you, and, and on to the next job sheet. Thanks.